Okay. How how's everybody holding up so far? I know it's been it's been a long day already, so uh, let me start with some questions. So, how many of you are building or maintaining an API? Yeah. Hold your hands up, hold your hands up. Um, and how many of those APIs are built on HTTP REST? Yeah. And how many of those APIs are built on GraphQL? Cool. And how many of those APIs are built on WebSockets? Ah, oh, still a few. That's cool. Awesome. OK. Um, all right, so I want to give you an overview of WebSockets and Go and how they fit into the picture of API design. In my talk, um, it doesn't have to be REST, uh, WebSockets and Go. So my name is Conrad. I work for a Silicon Valley startup, which is currently in a pre-launch phase. This is my second time at, Go, at the Golang UK conference, last time as a visitor, this time as a speaker. And I actually used to live and work for two years in London. And around that time in 2015, I also wrote my first Go program, which in fact was a jukebox run on Raspberry Pi, which would play sounds using webhooks um, to the office speakers once you enter a slash sound command into Slack. Um, that was our very first office hack uh, in order to compensate for the missing sound feature when we migrated from Campfire to Slack. Very fun. Uh, I don't know how you feel about your very first code program, but I'm actually uh, happy the company took the source code for that offline. Okay, uh, back to communication protocol. Let's start with a timeline. In 90. 91, we just had HTTP 0.9, and it couldn't have been simpler back then. We just had the HTTP GET method and the resource we were requesting. Then a little bit later, we got HTTP 1.0. Things became here a little bit more interesting, right? We finally got things like headers, um, other method support like posting forms, media types, cache. And then with HTTP 1.1, we got something like persistent connection. And this is super relevant because suddenly it was possible to have more than one request response pair on the same HTTP connection. And this was, in a way, the first step towards more real-time communication. And with real-time, I don't mean in the embedded sense, which would, for instance, mean if the airbag opens in your car that you're still alive, but rather in the sense it comes straight from the server. And then pretty much around the same time, REST was defined. And then in 2005, we got things like AJAX, basically introducing whole new ways to approach web applications. And we also got WebSockets, which allowed us for the first time to have like proper bidirectional communication on the web without any hacks or workarounds, where the server was finally able to actively push messages to the client. And with all of these developments, it's just a natural step that frameworks like React became so popular, introducing new concepts for not only retrieving, but also manipulating data. And we can say that like, if there's a time, then the time is now to make real-time communi uh, real communication a commodity, not only to provide live data, but really to bring the pos uh, best possible user experience to the consuming clients. So still, REST is now how old? Like 17 years. And even though it's so old, when we develop APIs, it's practically impossible not to mention it, which in a way speaks for REST, right? It seems to be quite a resilient chap. And, but what's REST anyway? So for me, it was always, well, you know, obviously it's like mapping HTTP verbs to resources, right? That's REST. Get retrieves a resource, post creates it, delete destroys it, the put method updates it. Well, it turns out that's not what really REST is all about. And let me already apologize beforehand for making an ac academic point now here, um, but I think uh, the fundamentals are so important because once you understand them, 
you get a whole new perspective on software architecture. So REST stands for Repre Representational State Transfer, and it was defined by Roy T. Fielding in his dissertation Architectural Styles and the Design of Network-Based Software Architectures, which I can only warmly recommend because for a dissertation, it's actually super readable. And basically, Fielding said there are two principles to approach the process of architectural software design. One says, cherry pick it. Build your system from familiar components until it satisfies the needs. The other one basically says start with a blank slate and then add constraints one by one. So the first one basically focuses on creativity and unbound vision. And the other one emphasizes restraint and really understanding the system context first. And for rest feeling shows a second approach. So let's have a quick look how he structured REST. Basically started with a blank slate. And the first thing to add is a client-server constraint, which means separation of concern, right? We don't want to mix the user interface and the backend. And the next one was he wanted that the connection should be stateless. What means stateless here? It means the session should only be kept on the client. If we make a request to the server, then that request should contain all the information necessary in order to respond to that request. On top of that constraint, the cache constraint was added. That means if I send you a request, then you have to make sure that you need to state whether the response you're giving to me is cacheable or not. And then most interestingly, the uniform interface constraint. And this here is really important because this is actually the one which gives us a reason why HTTP can so strongly be linked to REST. That constraint actually consists of four sub-constraints. One, it should be possible to identify a resource. With HTTP, that's done with URIs. Second, it should be possible to manipulate resources through representation. That's done with the HTTP verbs. Three, messages should be self-descriptive. That's done with different MIME types. And last, hypermedia should be the engine of application states. All that's basically done that hyperlinks are used to link together documents. And then there's also layered system and code on demand, which adds a hierarchical layer system, um, stating that every component should only be able to inspect its own layer, but not go beyond. And code on demand is optional, allowing applets or scripts to download and execute the, uh, the behavior locally. So, what has this to do with WebSockets anyway? First of all, surely the title is a little bit misleading because you could make the assumption, um, so, you know, it's either REST or WebSocket, that these two are parallel concepts and either you pick one or you pick the other one. But like so many things in Go, that as well is an orthogonal concept. One is the concept, the other one is a concrete implementation. And while REST includes the concept of resources and uniform interfaces, it doesn't really define, you know, every method should definitely always respond to the very same resource. There's nothing hindering us from using WebSockets to implement the mechanisms I just explained to you. And given that, the question is really why use WebSockets when we have something like HTTP REST already in place? For one, it's already there. Second, it has great compatibility promises. So what use cases are there really? Sadly, when introducing WebSockets, the two things which you usually get are chats and games. And yeah, that makes sense. Um, chats are like any conversation bidirectional, or at least that's our assumption of a conversation. Uh, obviously, we all know that's often not the case, but that's besides the point. And then we have games um, where yeah, you usually want to have real-time data coming in, especially if it's a game with a live action component to it. But the thing is, that's by far not all. In my eyes, a central argument for WebSockets should be synchronization. A synchronized state across your clients, across your devices. Why is that? 
The thing is, there's simply not just one application anymore. For instance, one browser or one on your mobile phone. No, there might be four of them. One on your phone, one on your tablet, maybe even one on your watch, one on your computer. Notifications, app state. We're living in a time where applications fight for our attention. And if we get annoyed by outdated application state and the need to clear the application state across different devices, we might get annoyed with the out, uh, application altogether. Right? So if you have something open in your browser and it still shows you have these two notifications there and you, know, you just swipe them away on your phone, like, why do I have to do it here again? Oh, just update it. You know, it could have been a lot faster. Now, you could go ahead and just pull the servers every time, asking for updates or changes. That's all fine. But really, how many clients do you serve? 500, 3,000, 60,000, 5 million? And the question really is, do you really want to have all these HTTP requests coming in at unpredictable intervals? No. What we really want is the application infrastructure or backend. When the state changes, we want to be the backend, the one which publishes these changes and pushes them to the client. If I swipe away a message on my phone, at the very same time, I want to see the change happening in the browser as well. And that's the way I want it to be. Like, not one second after that, but immediately. Okay. Let's get a little bit more technical. How does this all look like on the protocol level? Funnily enough, uh, HTTP GET request is used to instantiate the WebSocket connection. If you're used to HTTP headers, it shouldn't be too overwhelming. There's basically the uh, resource which is being requested is a server running on localhost. The WS denotes the WebSocket protocol. And then we have uh, specific fields, uh, header field upgrades to WebSocket, which was added in HTTP 1.1 to notify the server, hey, I want to use a different communication protocol. And then there's also base64 encoded key, which will be used in the response and a field denoting um, the header. And the response as well is fairly short. Basically, uh, the server's only possibility uh, to upgrade, uh, to inform the client that the upgrade succeeded is by sending the SEC WebSocket accept field back. Also stating uh, with the status code 101 that we're switching protocol. And really then from there on, it's really just two TCP sockets communicating with each other directly. And it's kind of funny because in a way we use the application layer protocol in order to establish a transport layer protocol. I mean, n not quite, but in my opinion, it's, it's pretty close. Yeah, and then we basically have this architecture here uh, of a bidirectional communication channel. And that there is a distinction between server and client, to be honest, that's only done uh, at the opening handshake, because after that, both parties are able to send actively and receive messages. At its core, WebSocket is a message-oriented protocol. Messages are split into frames. The payload can be either binary or text, which also means you can define your own sub-protocol. And it supports fragmentation, which prevents the endpoints from too much buffering. Now, I can, I can like, uh, hear your thoughts, like, what's all this theoretical stuff? I've come to the Golang UK conference to hear about Go. So at the very least, let me stare at some Go code. Um, this ain't no uni lecture about protocols, right? And OK, I'm sorry. Um, let's finally get started with Go. And let's look how this is all done in Go. Luckily enough, there's already a WebSocket library in the Go standard library. And for that, the first thing we need is a server. So we'll listen on port 4000. We already learned that uh, every WebSocket connection is established through a specific HTTP endpoint. So let's add that HTTP handler. And WebSocket.handler takes care of providing us with the connection, which can be upgraded to the WebSocket protocol. 
So what's the signature that WebSocket.handler takes? Okay, so basically one which provides us directly with a bidirectional WebSocket connection. So since the connection type implements the reader and writer interface, that's quite handy. It's also maybe a little bit odd because the reader and writer are really great when you're dealing with stream-oriented protocols, for instance, when you're writing to your file system. But okay, I mean, it's, it's still a handy interface, right? For instance, when you want to plug your components together, um, you can directly use a JSON marshaller with that as an example. And yeah, we can then just go ahead and write to the WebSocket connection. And if we want to listen to what the other side has to say, we can use read as well. But uh, we don't really want to hear what the other side has to say, do we? So on the client side, it's not so different. We specify the host, we specify the origin, and then dial up to the WebSocket connection. And then we can start writing to the WebSocket connection. And same goes for reading as well. So everything seems fine, right? doesn't need a lot of code. So is there like any reason to go any further into anything? Should we use a different library maybe? Um, I mean, there's not that much to the WebSocket protocol, it seems at least. Um, and the answer is kind of, but it really depends. So when we search for WebSocket libraries, uh, in my opinion, we more or less get the following results. So. The Gorilla WebSocket library leads by far, at least in terms of stars, but also in terms of imports, actually, and to other open source projects. What we don't really see here is how would the ratio be the same if we could also display private or proprietary repositories. OK, so let's have a closer look at the Gorilla WebSocket library. This library was actually created by Gary Bird. And when we already look into the readme of the Gorilla WebSocket library, we can see a pretty hefty comparison against uh, uh, Go standard library in terms of WebSockets. So the Gorilla WebSocket library comes with a lot of tension, a lot of de uh, attention of detail regarding the WebSocket protocol, which is defined in the RFC 6455 standard. So there's a test suite called Autobahn. So Autobahn, like the German motorway, um, and it's called probably that way because there are over 500 test cases covering, uh, covering um, the WebSocket protocol. That includes things like testing, is it possible to uh, receive fragmented messages? Uh, can you send a close message? Can you send pings and receive pongs? Or can you actually retrieve the message type uh, that you were sending? So is it text or binary? And really interesting here is that it also states that it wouldn't be possible to use the reader or writer interface of the Go standard library. And wasn't that what I was just using before when uh, I showed you a little code snippet how to implement WebSockets with the standard library? So let me explain you the difference and what they really mean here. Earlier, we learned that a message can consist of one or many frames. OK. So in that sense, we receive multiple messages when communicating through the WebSocket protocol. Now, in the code earlier, we saw we had to define a fixed byte slice for reading. Right? OK. Yeah, my God doesn't like that. Um, <laughs> so that means when we read or write, we either read until the buffer is full or until we hit a frame boundary. And in the Gorilla WebSocket library, on the other hand, it guarantees that read and write always give you the full message. And in that sense, it acts much more on the spirit of the WebSocket protocol. I also think it's a remarkable detail because these single method interfaces, reader and writer, are really, in my eyes, they form an ideal when it comes to great interfaces and go with their 
single purpose and their uniqueness in a way, but how they can be interpreted so differently. And in a way, it just goes to show how important implementation detail is, but also deciding for an interface contract. Because the Go language team is aware of that, but changing it now would break tons of projects. Now, let's have a look how all of that would look like using the Gorilla WebSocket library. First thing first, it's pretty much the same as before. We also need a HTTP server again to specify a handler which will be able to upgrade to the WebSocket protocol. As a next step, we define an upgrade struct. And here we use the default configuration, but it would also allow us to uh, fine tune it. For instance, we could add checks to check origin, or if we want to enable compression, or if we want to set a handshake timeout. And then we use that upgrader to upgrade the connection. We receive a connection similar to what we had in the Go standard library. But the difference here really is we have much more control already. You know, we can add code before the upgrade, like additional authentication or authorization checks. We can check, like, do we even want to upgrade the connection? And that's really important because quick intermezzo here. One thing which is really cool about WebSockets, they are stateful. And I know that's frowned upon, like statefulness is evil. You want to avoid that. Uh, but a thing is, this has also upsides. For instance, once the connection is established, it stays that way. So that can mean once we authorize a request for WebSockets, we can use that information. How we, would we authorize requests to a WebSocket connection otherwise if, if we send messages? It will be pretty much the same as with HTTP. We could include a session ID, which we are sending with every request, which gets parsed, and then we check if that request is actually allowed. But with WebSockets, we get a much better solution because we only need to send the authorization headers once. Then we decide what kind of permissions are we giving to this connection. And then it stays that way. And this has a very clear upside because by not sending credentials with every request every time, WebSockets are much less prone to CSRF attacks where you will would try to pretend that you are a different user. Okay, so let's continue. Um, then what? Um, then we would handle the connection, actually, which would look as follows. Um, and here we already see the different API approach. Uh, we read messages as a whole. We even get the message type back, which is binary or text. And for writing messages, it's pretty much the same. Under the hood, it uses the reader and writer interface too. But compared to the other library, it takes care of dealing with the frames in an appropriate manner. And there's actually also discussion whether the Golang WebSocket packet uh, should be merged with the Go standard library. But Brad says here, well, we can't just delete something and brave people who aren't bannering uh, can document that it's deprecated, perhaps. And yeah, he's right. Like, that's, that's not a good idea. But the good news is um, Gary even offered to, uh, to donate uh, the Gorilla WebSocket code to the Go project. And from the looks of it, uh, it seems they want to proceed and they also already started the process. So we might see some pretty interesting developments in the future there. So for those of you who are interested in, let's say, uh, getting a little bit more out of WebSocket libraries, because you can do a lot more in terms of efficiency uh, in order to optimize the use of WebSockets. And one particular library I want to point out is the WS library, because it exposes the uh, low-level primitives for using uh, WebSockets. With that library, for instance, it will be possible to reuse I.O. buffers. And a particular interesting feature is what they call zero copy upgrade. 
Because every time you make the connection with HTTP to upgrade the protocol, you also allocate memory. So if you want to even get rid of that, they offer the possibility to do an upgrade which just accepts the read and writer interface. And uh, the net.con type, for instance, satisfies that type. So. The code examples we've all seen so far, that's really the bare minimum to get something up and running, right? But after all, we want to utilize WebSockets and do something more interesting with it than just sending silly strings. So how could that architecture look like? In a classical HTTP infrastructure, we would have a backend, maybe connected to a data store, which exposes an API through which the client can communicate. Requests are sent, you get a response back, and if the client wants to see if anything has changed, it just needs to perform the request. So that's the typical case of polling architecture. Now, how could that look like in a push architecture? One way would be utilizing a message bus. Um, that could, for instance, be used for implementing the publish-subscribe pattern. That's especially useful when we either cannot or don't want to identify the receivers, but rather design everything around topics that clients can subscribe to. So a client would subscribe uh, through the API to the message bus, and every time the backend updates its state, that state would get published using WebSockets. And all the clients would receive this message independent of any action they would have required. So it doesn't, it doesn't need to be like that. Um, and that's something I had to realize actually with WebSockets. Because there's not necessarily a trade-off using WebSockets. It's not like, oh, this is all good, but I don't have these kind of real-time requirements. Uh, I just need to, yeah, I just need to request data and just want to send that down and that's fine. Like there's, you can basically implement your API using WebSockets in the very same way and you can implement it in such a way uh, that you're sending requests and receives the responses in a synchronous manner. But what you gain in addition to that, you get the flexibility to still push messages if you want to. You don't have to think at a later stage, oh, what am I going to use now, Firebase, Parse, any other library. No. Because you have put already everything into place. And what's more, you could design your own RPC protocol, for instance, by sending uh, JSON objects down, denoting the remote procedure to be called. So you don't like JSON? Okay, then. Let's use a Stomp-like protocol. And that's really what I want to point out. You have the full freedom to pick the format which really fits your system. So how could that look like from a software design point of view? So one way would be to, you could define uh, something called the message endpoint, uh, which takes a context, it takes a message type, the message type here, for instance, um, that is for you up to design. It can contain the information which you deem important or necessary. Also accepts the writer, which can be used to uh, write the messages back or sending responses if you want to. Uh, we could have a router struct, uh, which would be good in order to keep track of all the message endpoints. We also keep track of all the writers which would basically mean all the connections. And then the handle connection could look like that. At the beginning of the connection, we instantiate the writer, we wrap the connection type. Then we enter uh, the infinite loop, which takes care of processing all the incoming requests. And once we receive a message, we use the route method in order to look up the endpoint, we inspect the message, and then we decide which endpoint should be hit. 
And uh, for instance, uh, the connection is closed, we would leave the loop, and since we're a good citizen, we also clean up after ourselves, so we would remove the writer again. So, every connection, in a way, is already concurrent when we get that request, but once the connection is open, we also might want to have proper concurrency if the client sends a lot of these requests. And the easiest way, as usual, is to basically just put a go statement in front of the method, and that way we ensure that all the requests are processed concurrently as well. That, at least in my opinion, always the best way in order to achieve concurrency, because all other processing, like using channels to buffer certain messages, that's really that's the kind of optimization you want to do afterwards. First, you pick the most easiest uh, concurrency construct, and then once you hit and run to problems, you make it more concrete. Um, the writer struct uh, could be, for instance, identified by an ID we assign ourselves. And then what I usually do, so yeah, it seems like we, we don't get rid of like reader and writer interface. It seems to be a, a thing which goes throughout the talk. And uh, what I usually do is I wrap it once more into a write method. Under the hood, it still uses write message, but we gain the advantage of being compatible with other, uh, with other methods. For instance, if we want to directly use that with a JSON marshaller, which is pretty handy, especially in the message endpoints. So there's a discussion on the WebSocket Gorilla library to make it thread safe, because if you just do it like that and use the go statement, as I did just before, you will get a panic very quickly, because they made to make sure they will try to detect concurrent access and will just panic. And yeah, they, there's basically a discussion whether the library should take care of that, and I don't really agree with that. I don't think that's a great idea, because in my opinion, concurrency should always be left to the user, the consuming side. Because only you as a user know how you want to integrate this library and what's the best concurrency construct to integrate it in the most efficient way. And for the same reason, you would, for instance, very seldom find any APIs which return channels. So that's not really a problem for us, right? Because we can fix this by protecting access to the writer using a mutex lock. OK, let's recap. So we learned REST and WebSockets are not mutually exclusive. So while one's an abstract concept, and the other one's a technical implementation. And just because you don't use HTTP as a protocol doesn't mean that your, a that your API cannot be RESTful. Above all, WebSockets enable us to implement a push architecture, which can take very different forms. And this means especially one thing. It moves the authority to upgrade or inform the client of a state change to the backend, where the change actually happens and is noticed for the very first time. And we've also seen that WebSockets are low-level protocol, which actually gives us a lot of freedom in designing our own sub-protocol. And that's good, because that protocol, you can, you can design it in that way that it really suits the needs of your system. WebSockets are often mentioned together with the browser, because that's really where they became popular. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't limit yourself in that thinking. You can also use WebSockets to com, uh, connect your infrastructure components together. Now, the thing is with, with this approach I'm presenting to you, there's also a great deal of downsides. Rolling your own implementation can be costly. It takes time. And with your own protocol, you usually also have a hard time in terms of compatibility. And this is actually where it gets a little bit tricky, uh, because that's the point where a lot of people would disagree with me. Because generally, this attitude reflects really well the whole not invented here syndrome, meaning that 
yeah, let's just reinvent the wheel because why not? It's fun to roll our own implementations and do it ourselves. So generally speaking, not invented here is considered harmful because instead of emphasizing reuse and then again also contributing back to open source, open source solutions, everyone's just tinkering for themselves. But in my opinion, there's a clear upside to it because you don't always want to out, uh, outsource everything to off-the-shelf software. Maybe that particular part where you have to think about, should I roll out my own implementation or use an existing one? It's a question, does this component maybe form a profoundly core part of my product or of the business logic? Because then the question very quickly becomes, how sure am I that the framework I've just chosen, because a lot of people use it, how sure am I that it will support me in the long run? And it surely took me a long way to understand this after running over and over again to problems with libraries. Because I for sure myself consider myself also uh, as part of the other camp. But especially with those libraries which try to be overly generic in a space where you definitely want a more concrete implementation, it's sometimes better, better to create your own tailored solution. And that's also why the call to talk, it doesn't have to be REST. It doesn't have to be. It, it sure can be, but come on, let's not be too dogmatic about that. Going on trial and error can yield benefits. Rolling your own middleware can yield benefits. And sure, it takes time. But really what you do is you invest in your own stack. And you invest into domain knowledge that your team will gain. And once you need to add something, something which might be very special to the requirements of your system, you do it like this. Because you know, the ins and outs of the implementation. Thank you.